Romans chapter 12 this morning. We've been going through some verses. I'm calling them power verses. There are not better verses and not good, better verses in the Bible, but there are some verses that are more familiar than other verses. There are some that hold, I believe, some just dynamic, some powerful truth that if we let it, will grip our hearts and grip our lives. And when we come to this passage, a familiar passage, uh, one that many people have memorized in their life, but it is powerful when you let God use it in your life. God's Word always wants to be effective in your life. It's like the soap uh, in the shower. Your kids can run through the shower and not come out clean because the soap stood there on the side there. God's Word wants to cleanse you, wants to make you clean and whole, and if it will if you let it. Romans chapter 12, if you would, look in the first two verses where Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Lord, I ask for your help this morning. Lord, I ask that you would take this, these next few moments, and with your spirit, by your word, you would touch our hearts. Lord, help us to respond the way that would be appropriate to your word. Lord, may we not leave unchanged by your word, but in response to your word. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. I've entitled this message, A Reasonable Request. A Reasonable Request. There are times that people will ask you things that just aren't reasonable. And things like this, can I borrow your toothbrush? That is not a reasonable request. I don't want you touching my toothbrush. I don't want you looking at my toothbrush. You can't borrow it. How about this? Can I borrow your Bentley? Well, I don't have one, first of all, and if I had one, no, you can't borrow that thing either. I found some interesting things that people had asked for at hotels. One uh, consumer came to the hotel and they asked that the bath would be filled up with goat's milk. Now, who wants to swim in goat's milk? Apparently, it's good for the skin. Sometimes people have asked, they asked if they, could find, if they could find someone to help them purchase camels. And they did. They found, they found a camel dealer nearby the hotel. Apparently, as the story goes, they did not buy the camels because one of the camels was missing one of the humps. <laughs> Apparently, camel fraud's a real thing out there. A reasonable request. Oh, in marriages, sometimes there are reasonable and sometimes unreasonable requests. Honey, can you listen to this? Reasonable or unreasonable? I'll let you decide. <laughs> Honey, this will just take a moment. Yes, reasonable or unreasonable. But we come to this passage, and I believe what we see here is a reasonable request. If you follow this request, I believe it's a life-changing request. It is a uh, destiny-altering request. It is a, it is a request that, if you follow, will help you leave your mark the way God wants you to. You've ever been to the beach, and if you stood on the beach on the edge of the sand and the water and let the water kind of lap your feet, there's that place at that point where the sand is kind of mushy on your toes. And as you stand there, your feet really go into the, into the sand. If you step out of that spot, the water comes up and washes your footprints away at that spot right there. If we're not careful, if we live life for ourselves and live it our way, we will live a life that, that when we step away from it, the water will wash it away. The water of time will wash it away. But if you allow God to use you through these two verses in a very specific way that Paul presents to us, we can then have a monument built, not because we're good people, but because he is a great God. See, this is a reasonable request. There are times that your kids will ask you reasonable and unreasonable things. Dad, can I have a dollar? Typically, that is a reasonable request. And as a good father, you say, well, what is it for? And you find out, well, there is something. I remember growing up, I had an older sister. 
It seemed like in our house, when I'd ask for a dollar, my dad would say, here's four quarters, bring me back the change. But when my sister was asked, asked for a dollar, she said, here's a 20, keep the change. Not true, but as a second born with an older sister, second mom, reasonable request. I see in this passage that Paul presents to the people at Rome and to all the saints this request that transcends time and transcends culture. There are certain things that happen because of culture, because of timing. This one transcends all of that. A reasonable request. I see four different aspects inside of these two verses. I want to first of all notice that there is a plea. There is a plea. A request, if we can, a request. The Bible says this, and it's the second word of this verse, I beseech. You say that with me? I beseech. I begin to look that up and wonder, and really begin to work out what that word beseeched means. We don't use that word a lot anymore. In fact, I don't know that I've ever used it in a real conversation. You know, listen, I beseech you. We don't use that very much, and so sometimes that can be a little confusing to us. I looked up the background, the etymology of this word, and, and uh, began to learn about what it was talking about. And if we're not careful, we will think it just means, well, I'm going to ask you something. Now that is one element, it's very true, but this word beseech has so many more levels than just the idea of asking somebody. I'm afraid when we come to this verse too often, we address it as if Paul is just asking us to do something. I beseech you, I ask you. It's an option. Kind of like, you know, would you like a red car or a blue car? I ask you. It kind of, if we're not careful, we treat this verse as, hey, there's a couple of options here. You can either serve God or not serve God, and I just ask you to serve God. But there is so much more inside this word, beseech. It means to implore or to beg of someone. Well, that sounds pretty good. I, I, I can figure that out pretty quick. In fact, I have met some people who have, have begged for things. I've seen them on the side of the road before. Sometimes you help them, sometimes you don't. But, but they, they beg and they ask, like, wow, I've been to, on some mission trips, other people where they have real beggars. We don't have as many of those in America, but, but real beggars where they, they have nothing. And they're begging and, and, they're, and they're, pretty, they're pretty convincing. And you wonder if, if Paul is saying, I beg you, I beg you, I beg you. But I found an illustration of this word beseech that for me really opened up my eyes to what Paul is saying here. And if you would hold your finger in Romans, or if you have a tablet, uh, bookmark Romans 12, and turn to Mark chapter 5. I've mentioned this before, but the Bible says that Scripture is of no private interpretation. That means Scripture can help interpret Scripture. And I love when a passage, another passage, sheds light on another passage, when the two passages shed light on each other. And in Mark chapter 5, we have an example and starting in verse number 21, and when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And here it is, verse 23, and besought him greatly saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her that she may be healed, and she shall live. You can turn back to Romans chapter 12. What we have here is we have a dad whose daughter is about to die. A dad who has no other options, but a dad as a rule of the synagogue has heard about Jesus and knows that when Jesus comes to town, amazing things happen. He knows that when Jesus comes to town, the lame who used to not be able to walk now could walk. He knew that, that people who were blind, who could not see, now they can see. No doubt he had heard about people that had the devils cast out of them. And now this man, Jairus, he was the ruler of the synagogue. That means he was a religious person. He was someone that the other religious people said, we want to get rid of Jesus. But his little daughter was about to die. The other religious leaders, they didn't like Jesus because he was reigning on their parade, but he had a little daughter who was about to die. He risked his credibility, but he had a little daughter who was about to die. He risked being cast out of the synagogue, his prestige, his livelihood, everything that he was about. He risked it all because he had a little daughter who was about to die. 
And this man who had a little daughter who was about to die came to Jesus, the Bible says, besought him greatly. How do you think Jairus asked Jesus to heal his daughter? Oh, we have the words there. Do you think he said, Jesus, I have a little daughter who's about to die. Think you can heal her? Think how, do you think that's how he said it? Do you think he said, do you think he said oh, Jesus, I know you're probably busy today. Um, you mind healing my, 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 my baby girl? I don't think so. I don't think so for a moment. Can you see this man on the ground, maybe hugging Jesus' legs, saying, please, please, please heal my daughter? He had no other option. He besought him greatly. He knew that if this didn't work out, his little daughter was not going to make it. He besought him greatly. Can you put yourself in that dad's shoes for just a moment? When he said, please, would you please? It's a time when our little one, little James, was in the, uh, in the ICU. He got sick. He was really young. We prayed. And God touched his little body. But you learn about beseeching someone greatly. So when Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, when he says, he's not just saying, I'm going to ask you something. He's not just saying, hey, would you think about this? Can you get the idea that he's saying, listen, please, you've got to do this. You have no other option. There's a request here, but it is a passionate request. And straight from his heart. Not only is there a request there, there's a relationship. He says, I beseech you, therefore, what's the next word? Brethren. Brethren. How about brothers, family? You say, well, was Paul writing this to his, to his brother and sister? Well, not in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense he was. He was writing to the Christians. We find that out when you, when you look in the book of Romans and start at the beginning of it. You find out who Paul was writing to. He was writing to people who have trusted Christ as their Savior. You see, when he says this word, brethren, they'll know this because inside of Romans, before this, he would have talked about the sons of God. I love the book of Romans because it so clearly lays out the plan for salvation. Paul argues excellently in Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3 about how everyone is a sinner. He starts off in chapter number 1. He says that everyone has been touched by God. Everyone has been lit by God. Someone can look outside and see God's handiwork. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. You cannot live in this world and not recognize that something had to have happened that was not accidental. This morning, I use an amazing part of my, my body. I use my opposable thumb. It was amazing. It is so handy to be able to, and, and not really well, Brother Russell was, and I was having trouble with my thumb right there. You know, you can grip something and hold something. What if we didn't have thumbs? What if our eyeballs were on the bottom of our feet? That'd be tough to walk everywhere. We can look around and we can see that God's handiwork is everywhere. And Romans teaches us that. But, but then Paul says in Romans that many people have rejected that. They said, nope, I don't believe in God. I believe something else happened. He, he says this, that the, they worship the creation more than the creator. Isn't that true? People say, oh, great sun. Oh, great planet Earth, Mother Earth. I need to go hug a tree. And I think we ought to take care of what God gave to us, but it was from God. It is not God. Romans tells us beyond that in chapter 2 and 3 how everyone has sinned. He talks to the Jews. You think you're good. Think about this. And he ends with Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Maybe you've heard that verse before. Sometimes Christians, you quote that one and you miss the first three chapters. And for three chapters, Paul has been arguing why everyone is a sinner. Why everyone has done something wrong. Beyond that, he begins to talk about God's grace and his mercy through Christ Jesus in Romans chapter 5. But God commended his love toward us in that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. But some will reject that. He'll talk about walking in the Spirit. And he says, listen, if you, you, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And he says this, if you're led by the Spirit, you are then called the sons of God. That's Romans chapter 8. 
So as we walk in the Spirit, as we trust that Christ as our Savior, to, uh, as many as believed Him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. They then become the family of God, and that's when He says, brethren. What, he says, what He's saying is, I'm talking to those of you who have trusted Christ as your Savior. And Christians, we get real good at selective listening. Husbands, we're pros at it. Uh huh, uh huh, yes, dear, uh huh, got it. What'd she say? <laughs> Don't ask me that question, that's a hard question. Now, ladies, you can listen to all those things, and you'll worry about all of them as well. Man, if we don't listen to any of them and don't worry about a blooming thing in the process. But Christians, we become like men, we become selective listeners. Oh, we can sit in church and we look real nice. We come to church lots of times, we can say amen in the right spots. We stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, and hopefully not at the wrong time. We sit in about the same seat every week. Eventually, you need to move, we need to move some seats in this place. All right, you're messing me up in here, sitting in the same seats. I want us to move around a little bit. Get new, some, the Dalton's moved over here by the dead center. Come selective listeners. In this one, Paul says, I beseech you. I'm begging you. Like, like when Jarius begged for his little daughter's life, I'm begging you, and I'm talking to you as Christians. It's a relationship. So I'm talking to those who have been saved. You see, sometimes we say, well, this verse... And for those who were just saved, and they, they, they got saved last week, and, and they trusted Christ last week, and that's a great verse here. Here's a good verse for you, but I've been saved a long time, Brother Howell. I've been saved long enough that I, I've read my Bible through a few times. Praise the Lord. I hope you do. I hope you do. I hope you study God's Word. That doesn't make this truth any less powerful or practical today for me or for you. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. And then I see a reason. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. By the mercies of God. Lamentation says this, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Because His compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. You see, we could have a mercy service if we wanted to. We could share testimonies of what God has done for us. And if we were honest, if we were put our thinking caps on, we could go for hours, even days, about what God has done for us. Lives he has touched and changed. Homes he has put back together again. Answers to prayer. And I hope you're praying, and I hope you're seeing God answer your prayers. God wants to answer your prayers. Those are the mercies of God. He doesn't have to answer my prayer or your prayer, but he chooses to. He wants to. Those are the mercies of God. And Paul says, I implore you, I beg you, I beseech you Christians. Why? Because of God's mercy in your life. Because you're doing better than you ought to be doing. You're like, but, but Pastor Howell, I got some problems. But I tell you what, Problems in God's house are still a lot, a lot better than the problems in the devil's service. You say, my life's not perfect. That's right, it's not, you're not in heaven yet. But Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. My burden is light. My burden is light. I can parade for you homes that have been destroyed, been destroyed by lives of sin. Oh, a, few weeks, a few nights ago, I mentioned about alcohol in life. And, and listen, I am against alcohol for a Christian to drink and consume it as a beverage. In case you're wondering, I'm against it. I'm against it because the Bible teaches against it. But I'm also against it because it destroys homes. I can show you, I can bring it up to you and present for you people whose lives have been destroyed by alcohol. I can't, I don't know of anybody, anybody. I've never met anyone who says, you know what? My marriage is back together again because we both drink together. I don't know anybody that way. I don't know anybody who says, you know what? Brother Howell, you won't believe it. I am a multi-millionaire. Why? Because I drink alcohol. I don't know that. You see, sin destroys, but God's mercy brings life and newness. And Paul says, because God's been merciful to you, that's the reason I'm going to ask you to do something. You see, this is all just in, in the preliminary request. His plea. Before he even tells us what he's doing, he sets us up to say yes. Don't you hate those setup questions? People come up, I got a favor to ask of you. And what are you supposed to say? Sure. 
Okay, wonderful. Can I have your right hand? Oh, man, I should have, I should have thought through that first. Paul begins that with this plea. But then I see this morning a presentation. He says, I want you to present your bodies a living sacrifice. It is abnormal. Paul says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take that thing that you walk around in your body, your arms, your legs, your heart, your head, and I want you to present it as a living sacrifice. This is abnormal. Now, we don't really have sacrifices like they did in, in, in these Bible times. When he said a living sacrifice, they would have known what he was referring to. You see, this was written to the Romans and the Jews in Rome. And in the Jewish culture and religion, they often had to bring sacrifices. Those sacrifices were offered on an altar, and they were killed. Or in essence, you could only use it one time. You couldn't bring the same sacrifice multiple times because the sacrifice was now dead. And Paul says, no, 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 I want you to offer your body, your person, a living sacrifice. I'm not asking you to die physically, but to die spiritually. I want you to give up your dreams, your goals, your desires, a living sacrifice. Yes, I give up what I am and who I am and what I want for him, for God, a living sacrifice. He'll talk about what that means in the second verse. But he says, I want you to be a living sacrifice. It was abnormal. Mark, or Matthew, I'm sorry. Jesus says in Matthew, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. We live in a time where people want us to recycle, to use reusable things. They want us to, to reuse cups, and, and now certain places have, have outlawed straws, and so if you want a straw, you can bring your own or ask for it, but it's illegal for them to offer straws out in California, some place in California. They want us to not take a paper bag to lunch, but to, to buy a lunchbox so we save the environment, we, we recycle things, we reuse things. But the truth is, some things are meant to be thrown away. Is that not true? Some things are meant to be thrown away. But our lives are not one of those things. Our lives are not meant to be thrown away. Our, our every day we live is meant to be lived to the glory of God. And when we offer ourselves a living sacrifice, then that day is not thrown away. It is abnormal but he says, I want you to, to be acceptable. He says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. Once again, they would have known what that meant, the Jews, because when they brought an offering to the, to the, to the temple to offer as a sacrifice, it had to look a certain way, it had to be a certain way. It was only certain things that could be acceptable. And we, sometimes we live in a, in, in a mindset that, you know what, as long as I'm here, God should be happy. As long as I show up, then God should be pleased. I, I took time Sunday morning to come to church, so God, I hope you're happy with me. Well, that's not what God is looking for. We're holy and acceptable because Christ died for us. He makes us that way. Hebrews 13 tells us that he can make us perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is, there's that word, well-pleasing or acceptable in his sight. You see, he says, I want you to be acceptable. It's not just me showing up and saying, okay, God, here I am, use me. But it's saying, God, by your son, Jesus Christ, you've cleansed my life. God, by your son, Jesus Christ, I'm following your spirit, and you can use me. Lord, would you use me today? I want to be a living sacrifice so that today these hands are not my hands. They're your hands. These feet aren't your feet. They're your feet, or they're not my feet. They're your feet. And, and what I want to say, it's not my mouth. It's, it's your mouth, holy and acceptable. That means when you get angry, you're a sacrifice. Let him speak through you. When that lady takes your parking spot at Walmart, you're a living sacrifice. Be acceptable in his sight. When the cashier at Arby's 
can't seem to give you the right change four times in a row? Or was it somewhere the other day and, and uh, I said, I want to I wanna pay $25 out of this $100 bill. So I get change of 75. And she goes, um, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I'm having a little brain glitch. How much do you get back? I said, 75. Simple math. I'm his, his mouthpiece. When your co-worker just, just is driving that nail home right inside your heart and you just want to lash out and you've got the best one, you're a living sacrifice. When your wife or husband's irritated you, you're a living sacrifice. When you have that track to hand out and you're nervous, you're nervous because you don't know how they're going to receive it or reject it. You're his. You're acceptable in his sight. Not my sight. It's not what I want to do. It's what he wants me to do. I'm a living sacrifice. It's abnormal. It's acceptable. And last of all, it's appropriate this morning. It's a reasonable request. Why would you do this? Paul says, duh, it's reasonable. If I gave you a million dollars today, every one of you, I'm not, I don't have it. Yeah, I'm just a little shy. Sorry, this section. So, so these four sections. If I gave you all a million dollars, and then I said, would you do me a favor, just a small favor, would you just buy me a Diet Coke? I'm not taking that million. I don't want your crummy money if you ask me to buy you a Diet Coke. I don't think anyone here would say that, would you? You would say, well, sure. You want two Diet Cokes, Pastor Hal? I'll buy you, I'll buy you a whole case of Coke if you want it for a million dollars. That is what it means by a reasonable request. It, this is your reasonable service. Because of all that God has done, all he's asking is for you to say, God, your way. So when I wake up in the morning, I say, God, I'm yours. I'm yours. These hands, these feet, these ears, these eyes. This phone, it's yours. This job, it's yours. These kids, they're yours. This house, it's yours. This boat, it's yours. This hunting blind, it's yours. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Why? It's reasonable. After all he's done, it means this much. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your mercies that you've given to each one of us. Lord, your request is simple. The request is that we present our bodies a living sacrifice. That we say, God, whatever you want. Wonder this morning, there's someone here who would say, Pastor Howell, as you were speaking, God touched my heart. I've been living life my way. I've been going after my thoughts. Would you pray for me? I want to be that living sacrifice for the Lord. He can have my mind, my body, my goals, my dreams. Would you pray for me this morning? They have been saved five years, five seconds, or 50 years. Amen. He said, would you pray for me this morning? God touched my heart. Amen. 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 I wonder if there's someone here who would say, you know, Pastor Howells, you're talking about being a sinner and trusting Christ. I, I realize that I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. I realize that if I were to die today, I, I don't know that I'd go to heaven if I died today, but, but I'd like to know. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? I'm, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I, I'd like to be sure. I, I'll draw no more attention to you than I did to anyone else. I'd love to pray for you this morning. Though. Say, That's me. Just raise your hand, slip it up, slip it down. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Yeah, Lord, I ask you to bless this time of invitation. May we be that presentation that would be acceptable in your sight. Lord, bless this time in Jesus' name.